This is a lecture on problems for the chapter on states of matter. Make sure that you follow each problem and if you have a question on a problem, make sure you bring it into class and we'll talk about it in a group. We'll have a discussion. Also, uh, notes that you might take on this lecture over and above the problems. Uh, you can get some extra credit. Uh, also, don't forget that you know you don't have to do. You only have to do uh, a fraction of the problem. So if you do some of these and you work them out, uh, and you include answers that are above and beyond, you'll get extra credit. What pressure in kilopascals and in atmospheres does a gas exert at 385 millimeters of mercury? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, multiply 385 millimeters of mercury times factor of 1, 101.3 kilopascals divided by 760 millimeters of mercury. So the answer would be, you multiply it out, it would be 51.3 kilopascals. 51.3 kilopascals. Next, you want to uh, you want to calculate this in atmospheres, so you're going to multiply by factor of one of one atmosphere over 760 millimeters of mercury. The millimeters cancel out, you're left with atmospheres, and it's going to be about 0.5 ish, 0.507 atmospheres would be the answer. Number two would be the pressure at the top of Mount Everest is 33.7 kilopascals. Is that pressure greater or less than 0.25 atmospheres? These uh, first couple of problems are actually very simple, uh, just simple, simple, simple conversions. Just to get you used to the difference between atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, and kilopascals, you're just multiplying by a factor of one. The kilopascals are going to cancel, and you're going to be left with atmospheres. And it's going to be 0.333 atmospheres, which is, uh, which is greater than 0.25 atmospheres. Uh, you should know certain things. You should know... Uh, one atmosphere equals 101.3 kilopascals equals 760 millimeters of mercury. So, next, briefly describe the assumptions of kinetic theory as applies to gases. Probably the biggest one, and it's uh, it has to be done, uh, even though. Uh, it's uh, a little silly, but because uh, nothing's perfect. A gas is composed of tiny particles whose motion is rapid, constant, and random. Collisions between particles are perfectly elastic. No such thing. Uh, use kinetic theory to explain what causes gas pressure. What causes gas pressure? Well, it's essentially collisions, billions of collisions on... Um, on uh, the walls of the container or on uh, or on an object, an individual object. is the, What is the pressure on an object? But it's essentially uh, collisions. Uh, how is the Kelvin temperature of a substance related to the kinetic, average kinetic energy of its particles? How is the Kelvin in temperature of a substance related to the average kinetic energy of particles. The uh, Kelvin temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles. It's proportional, directly proportional. And I'm, and you're gonna sh I'm going to show you that in a moment. Convert the following pressures to kilopascals. Convert the following pressures to kilopascals. Okay. So we'll have a series of these. Again, it's just going to be uh, it's just going to be uh, a simple unit label conversions, 0.95 atmospheres. It's going to be approximately 100 or so, 
97 uh, kilopascals. Uh, one atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals. So 0.95 times 101.3 is going to be about 90 and 96 kilopascals would be the answer there. And uh, what else? The next one will be Again, you're just multiplying and canceling unit labels. Uh, 96 kilopascals. And uh, let's take the next one, which will be, wait for it, uh, 45 millimeters of mercury times 101.3 kilopascals divided by 760 millimeters of mercury. The millimeters of mercury cancel, and you're left with 6 kilopascals, which should make sense. 45 millimeters is a, is a very small number relative to 760 millimeters. And, and just remember, 101.3 kilopascals is equal to 1 atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, next. Number seven. A cylinder of oxygen gas is cooled from 300 Kelvin to 150 Kelvin. By what factor does the average kinetic energy of the oxygen molecule in the cylinder decrease? Well, it's proportional. And so you can use Kelvin. It's going to be uh, 300 to 150. So it's going to be by one half because it's proportional. You can't do it in Celsius, it would make no sense. But you can do it in uh, Kelvin, and you can because it's proportional. What factors help determine the physical properties of liquids? Let me change the timing on these a little bit. I'll be right back. The interplay between the disruptive motions of particles in a liquid and the attractions among the particles in terms of kinetic energy, explain how a molecule in a liquid evaporates. How does it evaporate? Well, it has to gain enough energy in order to do so. A molecule with certain minimum kinetic energy can escape from the surface of a liquid and vaporize. A liquid is in a closed container has a constant vapor pressure. What is the relationship between the rate of evaporation of a liquid and the rate of condensation? of the vapor in the container. Rate of evaporation of the liquid equals the rate of condensation of the vapor. There's going to be an equilibrium set up. What conditions must exist for a liquid to boil? Well, one of the major conditions is that the vapor pressure has to equal the atmospheric pressure. Particles throughout the liquid must have enough kinetic energy to vaporize. Make sense? Don't particularly like that answer, but explain why boiling point of a liquid varies with atmospheric pressure. Well, you have so you, the bo that bubble is forming. The bubbles are forming, and they can't form if the vapor pressure is not high enough. Boiling occurs when the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the external pressure. If the atmospheric pressure changes, the boiling point uh, will change. All right, here's a here's a. Uh, it says use figure 13.9 to determine the boiling points of the liquid uh, ethanoic acid, uh, 27 kilopascals, etc. Uh, let's uh, change the timings on this. It's gone way past it. Actually, let's go back to the problem before this because the, the, uh, the, the timings are a little bit fast. Hold on. Let me just read the answer to 13 again. Boiling occurs when the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the external pressure. If the atmospheric pressure changes, the boiling point will change. Okay, next, the graphs. It says use 13, figure 13.9 to determine the boiling point of each liquid. A, ethanoic acid at 27 kilopascals. Uh, B, chloroform at 80 kilopascals, and ethanol at 
50 kilopascal. So what I did was I drew black lines that intersect from the y-axis. I drew them over. So the first one was ethanoic acid at 27 kilopascals. So I drew that over at 27, between 27 and 40. Between 20 and 40, 27 I estimated it. And it comes up to be around 76-ish. And that's essentially what the answer is, so I kind of approximated it. And then chloroform, 80 kilopascals to chloroform, and that was 52 kilo, kilopascals, 52 degrees Celsius, sorry, 76 degrees Celsius, and ethanol was 50, and that was around uh, 62, but it's actually, that's the answer, I got something lower than that. But uh, that's what the answer is. The answer they get, came up with is 62. But it's actually a very rough guesstimate. Uh, any any uh, one of many answers could, uh, could be consistent with those graphs. Okay, and those are the answers. 76, 52, and 62 uh, degrees Celsius, respectively. Okay, now, explain how evaporation lowers the temperature of a liquid. Well, when something evaporates, it's going to take uh, energy with it. When the molecule with the high, highest kinetic energy escape from the liquid, the average kinetic energy of the remaining particle is lower and the temperature decreases. In general, how are the particles arranged in solids other than very carefully? Uh, their their par particles and solids are packed tightly together in an orderly arrangement, the locations of the particles are fixed. What does the shape of a crystal tell you about the structure of a crystal? What does the shape of the crystal tell you about the structure of the crystal? The shape of the crystal reflects the arrangement of the particles within the solid. And we'll see that when we look at, uh, I have a, a whole lecture on crystals. How do allotropes of an element differ. What are allotropes? Anyway, what are, what does that mean, allotropes? Uh, allotropes are different mole molecular forms of the same element in the same physical state. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. What phases are in equilibrium at a substance's melting point? At the melting point. What phases? So it would be a liquid and solid. Uh, I hope that's pretty elementary, that you should know that, uh, pretty cold, uh, no pun intended. Uh, 19, how do the melting points of ionic solids generally compare with those of molecular solids? Uh, melting points of ionic solids. Ionic solids generally have high melting points and high boiling points. If any, if, unless it decomposes, then do molecular solids. What is the difference between a crystal lattice and a, and a unit cell? It's pretty self-explanatory what a unit cell is. A crystal lattice is the repeating array of a unit cell. So the lattice is really what it's going to look like, what's going to be the overall structure of it. And you'll be able to see evidence of the unit cell. What property must the solid have to undergo sublimation? What properties must the solid have so sublimation occurs in solids that have vapor pressures that exceed atmospheric pressure at or near room temperature. What do the curved lines on a phase diagram represent? Those are boundaries between the various phases. The lines show the conditions of temperature and pressure at which two phases exist in equilibrium. Very well said. But they're boundary lines, essentially. Describe one practical use of sublimation. Describe, we used to, we used to do in organic chemistry lab to purify, uh, like for instance, uh, caffeine, when we would ma make that in the laboratory. Freeze-dried coffee, dry ice as a coolant, air fresheners, separating liquids, uh, mixtures, and purifying substances. That's what we used to use it for. What does the triple point on a phase diagram represent. The triple point describes the only set of conditions at which three phases can exist in equilibrium. So it's a point of equilibrium. 
here's a phase diagram. Use uh, this this phase diagram has to make the boiling point of water at a pressure of 50 uh, kilopascals, and you can see how I drew it over and down. And uh, let's change the timing on that and go back to that just for a moment. And you can see how I I drew from 50 kilopascals over where it meets the line down to 60 degrees Celsius. Again, that's an estimate based upon what I know the answer to be. So at least it's pretty consistent with the answer. You, uh, so it's 60 degrees Celsius is the answer. And that's how I got it. You just start at the y-axis and you draw it over and then down. What is meant by an elastic collision? No deformation, uh, no loss of energy due to heat. Uh, an elastic collision in an elastic collision energy is transferred between particles without any loss of energy whatsoever and no deformation of the particle. Uh, <clears throat> which of these statements are characteristic of matter in the gaseous state? Which one of these statements are characteristic? Gases fill their containers completely. Is that consistent? with matter in the gaseous state. Absolutely. Absolutely. A solid will not, of course. Uh, a solid will not, of course. Although there certainly is empty space within a gas. Gases exert pressure. Absolutely. Gases absolutely exert pressure. Next, yes, then, gases do exert pressure. Absolutely. Next would be gases have mass. Yes, they do indeed. Gases have mass. Absolutely. Next would be... Yes, they have mass. They have weight. Gases have more energy than solids or liquids. What else? Think about gases. The pressure of a gas is independent of its temperature. Absolutely not. They are related. They are, it is, there is a direct relationship between pressure and temperature of a gas, and the answer to that would be no. And I think that pretty much covers it. Is there another one? Maybe E, okay. Gases are compressible? Absolutely. Gases are definitely compressible. There's so much space between uh, the particles of a gas that you can easily compress it. So the answer to that is yes. I think I'll do before I finish, I think I'll try to get up to question 35. Uh, these are running 15 seconds apiece, or less, 8 seconds. Oh, the distances between particles in a gas are relatively large. Absolutely. That's why they're compressible. And that's probably going to be it. I think there's only 6 of them. Okay, list the various units used to measure pressure and identify the SI. Pressure is newtons per meter squared, uh, which is a pascal, uh, and that's the SI. Millimeters of mercury, atmospheres, those are, those are the three big ones. Uh, change 1656 kilopascals to atmospheres, so divide by 100, so it's about 16 or so, 16 and change. You should be able to do that in your head, get at least an approximation. I'm not going to actually show you the work for a conversion. These things should be pretty simple. It's pretty simple. Convert uh, 190 millimeters of mercury to the following kilopascals. It's going to be about a quarter-ish, a quarter, so it'll be about 25. There you go. Um, atmospheres, it'll be about a quarter, 0.25. Atmospheres of pressure would be about 0.25-ish, 0.27, so 0.25, yeah. And I think that's probably it, because it's usually millimeters of mercury, kilopascals, and atmospheres anyway. Explain the relationship between the Kelvin temperature of a substance and the kinetic energy, they are proportional to one another. Uh, the kinetic temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy. 
I think I we had that earlier. I think we already did that problem, but maybe not. How is the average kinetic energy of water molecules affected when you pour hot water from the kettle into cups at the same temperature as the water? Hmm, interesting. If the temperature does not change, the average kinetic energy is not affected. So, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy, if you'll recall. What does the abbreviation STP represent? Standard temperature and pressure. Zero degrees Celsius, 273 Kelvin, and 101.3 kilopascals, or one atmosphere. Standard temperature and pressure. What is significant about the temperature absolute zero? Uh, what I'm going to let you think about this. What is significant about the temperature absolute zero? The absolute zero, at absolute zero, the motion of particles would theoretically cease. It is the temperature at which there is no movement of particles. By what factor does the average kinetic energy of molecules of, of gas in an aerosol container increase when the temperature is raised from 27 degrees Celsius to 627 degrees Celsius? The average kinetic energy triples. So you have to convert it to Kelvin. That's the trick in order to be able to do that. Explain why liquids of gases differ in density and ability to be compressed. Spaces between the molecules, they're far apart. The particles of a gas are relatively far apart compared to the particles of a liquid because of the extra spaces between particles a gas is less dense and easier to compress. 37. 37. Compare the evaporation of a liquid in a closed container with that of a liquid in an open container. The liquid in a the evaporation of a liquid in a closed container will reach an equilibrium, whereas in an open container it is less likely to do that unless you have a lot of humidity. In both cases, particles with sufficient kinetic energy move from the liquid to the vapor phase in a closed container. A dynamic equilibrium is set up between the contained between the contained liquid and its vapor. Describe what is happening at the molecular level when a dynamic equilibrium occurs. What is happening with dynamic equilibrium? Well, dynamic is means movement. Two opposing processes occur at identical rates. Uh, and they're happening. There's movement. Dynamic means movement. Equilibrium means a balance. There's a balance movement. 39. Explain why increasing the temperature of a liquid increases its rate of evaporation. Higher temperature, higher kin average kinetic energy, a higher rate of evaporation. And I think we'll do one more. More molecules have enough energy to escape the attractions within the liquid. <coughs> and 40, the last one for tonight, is going to be as follows. It is going to be, would you expect a dynamic equilibrium in a liquid in an open container? Not really, uh, unless it's extremely humid outside, like extremely humid, but I don't think so, not really. Uh, no, in, in an open container, most of the particles that escape from the surface of the liquid as vapor do not condense back to liquid. Describe the effect that increasing temperature has on the vapor pressure of a liquid. Describe the effect that increasing temperature has on the vapor pressure of a liquid. The average kinetic energy increases, which allows more vapor to form above the liquid. 760 millimeters mercury is the standard pressure. However, the SI unit for standard pressure is going to be in kilopascals, and it would be 101.3 kilopascals. Distinguish between the boiling point and the normal boiling point of a liquid. What is the distinguish between the boiling point and the normal boiling point of a liquid? Now, we know that the boiling point of a liquid can change depending upon the pressure, the vapor pressure, that can be manipulated. Let's see what it says. The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. At the normal boiling point, the external pressure is 101.3 kilopascals. Like I said before, that's the standard. That's one atmosphere. That would be, that would be the air atmospheric pressure at sea level. 
It says use the graph to answer each question. I know what you're saying. Where is the graph? Well, because of the timings, I put this for 15 seconds, so we're trying to kill some time here. But the graph will come up. And it says use the graph to answer the question. There's the graph. And look what it says. It says it's vapor pressure in millimeters of mercury. We know it should be kilopascals, but that's okay. Versus temperature. Now look at the parabolic shape of the curve that relates vapor pressure in millimeters of mercury with temperature. And look how high the pressure goes. It goes quite high. And also understand that the, the atmospheric pressure, the normal atmospheric pressure at one atmosphere for merc in terms of mercury is 700, so it goes beyond that. But look and see how it's parabolic. That's a very, very important trait when it comes to this particular graph of vapor pressure versus temperature. And one of the reasons for that is has to do with gases and how they expand with temperature. Okay, now let's, let's see what the next question is going to be. Here it is. What is the vapor pressure of water at 40 degrees Celsius? So what you do is you go to 40 degrees Celsius and you, you draw a line vertically from 40 degrees Celsius over to the line. And it's going to be somewhere, somewhere less than 100, considerably, maybe 50. Yeah, 50 millimeters of mercury. You see what I'm doing? I'm trying to answer the question before the answer actually comes up on the screen. And that's what you should also be doing. Now let's look, let's wait for the next one. I think it's going to be B, judging from the typo next to mercury. And it says, at what temperature is the vapor pressure of water 600 millimeters of mercury? So now we're going to go over to the y-axis, and we're going to draw a line straight over and then straight down. And you're going to see that, well, it's hard to see the screen from where I am, but you may have a better, it's going to be somewhere under 100 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, somewhere, if I can read that correctly. Maybe 95, is that what you guys see? 95 degrees Celsius at 600 millimeters of mercury. Let's see what that says. Wait for it. Maybe I'll change the timing. Yeah, 94 degrees Celsius. You can tell I got new glasses. All right, very good. All right. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and change the timing so we're not waiting for as long for the question to come up. Be right back. You'll never know I was gone. What is the significance of the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees Celsius? Well, first of all, it means that the vapor pressure and the atmospheric pressure are the same. So the uh, the value for the standard pressure would be 760 millimeters of mercury. That is the S in the STP. Explain how boiling is a cooling process. Well, when the molecules of higher kinetic energy escape from the water, it takes energy with it. So escaping molecules have more kinetic energy than the average. Thus, the average kinetic energy of, and temperature of the remaining molecules are lower. Name at least one physical property that would permit you to distinguish a molecular solid from an ionic one. Well, ionic solids have very high melting points, very high boiling points. Molecular solids are the opposite. Ionic compounds generally have higher melting and boiling points. It doesn't say that there, but higher melting points. Uh, they would have to be in controlled environments to have, uh, actually have a, a boiling point than do molecular solids do. Uh, describe what happens when a solid is heated to its melting point. Describe what happens when a solid is heated to its melting point. And the answer is, the particles have sufficient kinetic energy to overcome the attractive forces holding them in place. And you increase at that point, you increase the potential energy of the particles. 
explain why molecular solids usually have lower melting points than ionic solids. Explain why molecular solids usually have lower melting points than ionic solids. The intermolecular attraction between molecules are weaker than the attraction between ions. Much weaker. Matter of fact, the, the, the more, the strongest intermolecular attractions involve either ions or close to ions, such as uh, hydrogen bonding. When you remove the lid from a contain, food container that has been left in, in a freezer for several months, you discover a large collection of ice crystals on the underside of the lid. Water from the food sublimed and then condensed on the lid. So that's an interesting uh, point. That's a wonderful, uh, wonderful evidence of the sublimation because the pressure is also low because of the fans that are in the freezer as well. Explain why a liquid stays at a constant temperature while it is boiling. Explain why a liquid stays at constant temperature while it is boiling. The temperature remains constant while the liquid boils because the energy that is added is used to vaporize the molecules. So um, it's kind of directed into that way so you know it doesn't can't get hotter. Uh, what is the normal boiling point of ethanoic acid? What is the normal boiling point of ethanoic acid? Uh, so, uh, how would you tell? Well, look at the 101.3, and we'd be at 121. That's where it hits normal atmospheric pressure. 101.3 kilopascals, up top, upper right. Which liquid has the highest vapor pressure at 40 degrees Celsius? Well, the one on the far left, the purple line would, so it's going to be chloroform. That would have the highest. Uh, which liquid has the highest vapor pressure at 40 degrees? I think we just did that, right? Yeah, chloroform. And then C will be... C will be... At standard atmospheric pressure, which of the substances are in the gaseous phase at 70 degrees Celsius? So 70 degrees Celsius, the only one that has boiled is the chloroform. Okay, so let's see. I don't know if there's a D or not. So let's see what it says. Uh, D, or the next problem, will be... Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at standard pressure. How would the pressure on the ethanol and on the ethanoic acid have to change for these liquids to boil at 100 degrees Celsius? The external pressure on ethanol would have to increase. The external pressure on the ethanoic acid would have to decrease. Excellent question. If you can do D, you understand D, you're good. That's a good one. That's a very good problem. Describe evaporation, vapor pressure, and boiling point. Describe evaporation, vapor pressure, and boiling point. Let's change. I'm going to stop this in a moment and change the timings on these. These are a little bit too long in terms of timings. Evaporation is the, con converse, the conversion of a liquid to a gas or vapor when the liquid is below its boiling point. The vapor pressure is the force per unit area exerted by the vaporized particles on the walls of the sealed container. The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the external pressure. Why is the equilibrium that exists between a liquid and its vapor in a closed container called a dynamic equilibrium? Although the net amounts of vapor and liquid remain constant, some molecules are evaporating while an equal number of molecules are condensing. This is the data for number 54. Uh, the table gives vapor pressure of isopropyl alcohol at various temperatures. It says to graph the data, use a smooth curve to connect the data points. It's very difficult on Excel to use a, sm to use a smooth curve uh, with this data. It was just very difficult. So. What I did, I simply connected the dots, which is not recommended, 
but it certainly will get the job done. And on the next four slides after this, you'll see the graph and then the questions that are asked uh, regarding the graph. The temperature will be on the X scale and the vapor pressure on the Y scale. And here is the graph. Let's look at the graph for just a moment. Vapor pressure in kilopascals versus temperature. It's always Y versus X. And you're going to be asked, asked to read either a temperature on the x-axis and the corresponding y-value or, or a pressure on the y-scale with a corresponding temperature on the x-scale. Okay, here we go. Here's the first question. Uh, and it says, what is the estimated normal boiling point of isopropyl alcohol? So let's look at uh, the question for a moment and see if we can come up with some kind of idea on how to draw uh, in lines that will intersect the curve and give you the answer. So the question is, what is the estimated normal boiling point of isopropyl alcohol? So, well, what is the normal boiling point? The boiling point for any substance uh, relative to normal, normal is uh, standard, really. It's one atmosphere, and one atmosphere is rounded because it doesn't work well with uh, uh, one's place. This particular scale, it's just not, it's just not precise enough. So it would be 101.3 kilopascals is one atmosphere. So you could round it really to 100 kilopascals. So you put a horizontal line uh, along 100 from 100 kilopascals until it intersects the graph and then you come down. Well I happen to know that the boiling point is about 80, 79, 80. So uh, that's actually what's going to happen. And so you, you have 80 degrees. So 80 degrees Celsius. So, and that is correct actually. It's close enough. So the, uh, the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol at one atmosphere, normal, quote-unquote normal, would be 80 degrees Celsius. That would be the answer. Now, the next problem, B, is going to be, what is the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol when the external pressure is increased to twice standard pressure? See what said normal, and now it says standard. It's actually standard temperature and pressure, but it's standard pressure. Standard temperature and pressure is one atmosphere and and uh, zero degrees Celsius. So this is one atmosphere though, so it's standard pressure. And the answer would be 200 and then it would go to 100. So 200 kilopascals intersects right at 100 and that's the answer. Okay, so you simply draw and uh, draw in the, uh, the value, just the horizontal line at 200, that's twice the standard pressure rounded of course and then you intersect and then you drop a line down vertically down straight down and you get 100 degrees celsius in a series of liquids as the intermolecular forces of attraction strengthen uh, would you expect the vapor pressure to increase or decrease in a series of liquids as the intermolecular forces of attraction strengthen so it would decrease uh, as the attractions become stronger, it becomes more difficult for molecules to, con to overcome the attractions and to vaporize. Predict the physical state of each of these substances as, as at the indicated temperature. Use the melting point and boiling point data from the table below. Well, so let's have a look at the table, and that's going to come up. Okay, so here's the melting point and boiling point and use the melt it says uh, predict the physical states of each matter at the indicated temperature so we're going to be given a series of temperatures and we want to see what's going to be all right phenol at 99 degrees okay that's going to be that's between melting and boiling so that's going to be a liquid right that's going to be a liquid because it's between melting and boiling at 99 degrees and that's correct it would be a liquid 
All right, B. Let's see how we can do this one. B. Wait for it. Now, do you see why that phenol at 99 degrees is a liquid? Okay, it's between the melting point. Let's see. Ammonia at negative 25. Okay. Ammonia at negative 25. Negative 25, it's above the boiling point. So if it's above the boiling point, it would be gas, right? So it already boiled. So it would be a vapor. So vapor is correct. All right. Next. I could speed up these, but it's nice to discuss this. Uh, I want you to know how I'm doing it in my own mind. All right. Methanol in an ice bath, water bath. So it's going to be methanol at about zero degrees Celsius. Okay. Methanol. Zero degrees Celsius. So that's between the melting and the boiling. So that's a liquid. That's a liquid. Methanol is going to be a liquid in an ice bath. Okay. Uh, uh, ethanol is also a liquid at, uh, at an ice bath. You know, the ethanol is uh, what people, you know, it's an alcohol and uh, it's an alcohol. And a lot of the alcohols are, are going to have the same idea. They're going to be around similar to water. Methanol in a boiling water bath. All right, so that's going to be above the boiling point. So that's going to be a vapor. Yep, that's it. That's going to be a vapor. So a lot of the alcohols, see the, see the word O-L, o, the letters O-L, that indicates that it's an alcohol. Methanol would be one carbon, methane, etc. Ethanol is two carbons, so it would be ethanol. Ammonia at negative 100 degrees. That's going to be, wow, that's going to be a solid. Ammonia at negative 100 degrees is going to be a solid. And that's going to be E. That's correct. Absolutely. So you have methanol, you have uh, ethanol, propanol, isopropyl alcohol, isopropanol, OL again, uh, butanol, pentanol, hexanol. All right, phenol at 25 degrees. Phenol at 25 degrees. That's going to be less than the melting point. Phenol at 25 degrees Celsius. It doesn't melt until 40 degrees Celsius. That's like Abu Dhabi in the spring here, the late spring. Yep. Okay, so that's going to be a solid. Okay, when the temperature is 40.9 degrees outside, it is hot. Okay, it's actually, was, I think, around 40 degrees today. All right, Mount McKinley in Alaska is the tallest peak in North America at 6,194 meters. That's pretty tall. The atmospheric pressure of the peak is 44 kilopascals. Use figure 13.9 to find the boiling point of water at the peak uh, of Mount McKinley. And it's going to be, uh, let's see, it's going to be about, about 80 degrees-ish. You see that it says 44 kilopascals. So 40 crosses it less than 80. So 44 will be a little bit less than 80. 78, 79, something of that nature. So it'll be somewhere around late 70s, somewhere between 75 and 80 degrees Celsius will be the boiling point at 44 kilopascals and the book says 77 which is sounds about right that sounds about right okay next question it says what causes atmospheric pressure and why is it much lower on the top of a mountain than it is at sea level atmospheric pressure results from the collisions of particles in air with objects there are fewer particles in a given volume of air at the top of a mountain than at sea level. In Mount Everest, it's about 33, as we saw earlier, it's about 33 kilopascals. So it's considerably lower there and, uh, than it is at sea level. Pouring liquid nitrogen onto a balloon decreases the volume of the balloon dramatically, as shown in the photograph below. In time, the balloon reinflates, as shown in the photograph on the right. Use kinetic theory to explain the sequence of events. The temperature of liquid nitrogen is about negative 196 degrees Celsius, which is pretty cold. Uh, absolute zero is negative 273, so it's uh, pretty close. Uh, 
Uh, as the temperature drops to one, negative 196, the average kinetic energy of particles in the air decreases drastically, as does the pressure. So the volume of the balloon, which is a flexible container, decreases. As the balloon warms back to room temperature, the average kinetic energy of the particles increases and the balloon expands to its previous volume. The balloon expands to its previous volume. It's essentially uh, temperature and volume, isn't it really? Charles Law. What role does atmospheric pressure play when someone is drinking a liquid through a straw? What role does atmospheric pressure play? When you drink, when you draw on a straw, the pressure inside the straw is less than the pressure, atmospheric pressure, on the liquid in the container. So liquid is pushed up the straw. So the liquid is pushed up the straw. Your layup partner measures the boiling point of water in an open beaker at 108.2. Even though you know that water can be made to boil at this temperature, you ask your partner to repeat the measurement. Hmm. Possible answer. Since the beaker is an open container, the water should boil at 100 degrees Celsius at or close to sea level. Your partner probably misread the thermometer and should recheck the value. Yeah, one, that's, a, that's a pretty big mistake. So I would suggest to do that as well. What everyday evidence suggests that all matter is in constant motion? What everyday evidence suggests that all matter is in constant motion? Well, possible answer. Odors will travel through a room. Ink will spread throughout a beaker of water. Uh, molecules move very, very fast extremely fast. So you open up a bottle of perfume in the back of the room, you're going to smell it very quickly in the front of the room. Is the average kinetic energy of particles in a block of ice at zero degrees Celsius the same as or different from the average kinetic energy of the particles in a gas-filled weather balloon at zero degrees Celsius? The average kinetic energy is the same because the temperature is the same. Remember, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. Average kinetic energy is the sum and division of all collisions. Are perfectly elastic collisions possible between objects that are large enough for you to see? No. Collisions between large objects involve some loss of kinetic energy uh, to heat, and really so do small particles, but we don't talk about that because we're talking about the ideal nature of gas. How does perspiration help cool your body on a hot day? Well, water evaporates, and because the evaporation of the perspiration is endothermic process, the skin is cooled. The water evaporates and takes the heat of the body with it. Why do different liquids have different normal boiling points? Well, first of all, boiling point is, a, is an intensive physical property, and each uh, substance has different. The intermolecular attractions in some compounds are stronger than others. Yeah, there's, the, there's the different structures of different particles that cause different, uh, different uh, attractions. There is a liquid vapor equilibrium in a container. Explain why the vapor pressure in the container is not affected when the volume of the container is changed. The vapor pressure depends only on the kinetic energy of the escaping molecules. Big, very important. 67, very important. A teacher wants to demonstrate that unheated water can boil at room temperature in a beaker within a bell jar connected to a vacuum pump. However, the vacuum pump is faulty and can reduce pressures to only 15 kPa. Can the teacher use the vacuum pump to perform the demonstration successfully? Explain your answer. Very interesting. Can they do it anyway? 15 kPa. What is the boiling point of 15 kPa? Well, you can look it up. Uh, First person to tell me that will get some extra credit. No, at 15 kPa, water would boil at a temperature of about 50 degrees Celsius. There you go, sorry, which is much higher than room temperature. You have two similar sealed jars of water at the same temperature. In the first jar, there is a large amount of water. In the second jar, there is a small amount of water. Explain how the vapor pressure can be the same in both jars, even though many more water molecules are evaporating in the first jar. Hmm, as they say, when the plot thickens, the plot is about to thicken. The kinetic energy of the molecules in the vapor is the same in both cases, so the vapor pressure 
is the same. Why are pressure cookers recommended for cooking at high altitudes? I lived at high altitudes, and trust me, it took a lot less time to cook my food with the vapor, with the, uh, with the pressure cooker. At high altitudes, the boiling point of water is less than 100 degrees Celsius. Because the atmospheric pressure is lower, the increased pressure in the pressure cooker increases the temperature at which water boils. A mixture of gases contains oxygen, nitrogen, and water vapor. What physical process could you use to remove the water vapor from the sample? Condensation of the water vapor on a cold surface. Very good. On a cold surface. The ions of sodium chloride are arranged in face-centered cubic pattern. Sketch a layer of ions in a crystal of sodium chloride. There it is, but it's difficult to interpret, but that is a face-centered face -centered, uh, cubic uh, sodium chloride molecule. Here are the crystals, the seven crystals you have to know. Use figure 1311, which I just showed you. Identify the crystal system described by these characteristics. There they are. Very interesting. It gives the ideas of what the sides, the relationship between the sides, or among the sides and among the angles. What is three unequal edges meet at right angle? Three unequal at right angles. All right, it's not that one. Okay, it's not that one. Interesting. Interesting. Looks like orthorhombic. Looks like orthorhombic. Unequal edges meet at right angles. See the orthorhombic? None of the sides are equal, yet they're all 90 degrees. They're mutually 90. So that's interesting. All right, next question. That's, this, that's all the stuff there. It says... Three equal edges with three equal angles that are not right angles. Oh, equal angles that are not right angles. Isn't that interesting? So it's not, it's not cubic. I wouldn't imagine. Or am I, or am I talking and trying to confuse you? Interesting. Let's see what the answer is. <gasps> rhombohedral. That's right. Rhombo, rhombohedral. Three equal edges. Very good, very good. Rhombohedral, and that is correct. I can see that. You see that? Those weird angles, alpha, beta, gamma in the lower right. Calcite. Okay, two equal edges and one unequal edge meet at right angles. Meet at right angles. All right. Can you see that? Two unequal Two equal and one unequal, is that what it said? You're going to have to stop it and look back. See if you can figure it out. I have a film that I'm making on uh, tetragonal. Very good. Two equal edges and one unequal edge meet at right angles. Tetragonal. All right, here's another picture of it. What I'm doing is I took a... I did a lot of research on, uh, on uh, minerals, these seven minerals and made a lecture on it uh, and that's going to be good three unequal edges do not meet at right angles so three unequal edges at crazy angles so try clinic very good try clinic try clinic's interesting mineral and uh interesting geometric shape for minerals i mean Three, un, three equal edges meet at right angles. Three equal edges, and that's cubic. That's right. That's absolutely cubic. That's cubic. That one's the easy one. Okay, let's see. What do we have next? All right, use this drawing to answer the question. This is body-centered cubic, by the way. Uh, cesium chloride. You see that there's something in the middle of all those? That's called body-centered cubic. What type of unit cell is in a lattice cesium chloride. Well, I kind of gave you the answer. Um, it's body-centered cubic. That's an easy one. Body in the center. And it's cubic. Body-centered cubic. 
What is the coordination number of cesium? Well, it says right there. You tell me. What is the coordination number of cesium? It's 8. 8. And why is it 8? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Well, because it's going to be with 8, um, eight cesiums. You see, the chlorine is the body center. Based on the diagram, what is the formula of cesium chloride? It's going to be CSCL, uh, 1 Cl minus ion, and 8, 1 half, 1 eighth, uh, 1 eighth uh, cesiums. So 8 times 1 eighth is, is 1, so CSCL. Relative humidity is defined by the following equation. That's relative humidity. A is, it says, A is, A is, uh, a is the pressure of the water vapor in the air, and B is the equilibrium water vapor of water in the air at that temperature. Can the relative humidity ever exceed 100 degrees? No, because you're the one saying it's relative. So it says no. If A and B are equal, then the water vapor will condense at the same rate at, uh, that the liquid evaporates. So it's like a... A saturated solution, a saturated solution of water in the air can't get more than that unless it's super saturated, and that sometimes works, but that's for another day. The solid liquid equilibrium line in a phase diagram of a given substance slants to the right. How is the substance freezing point affected by increased pressure? The freezing point increases, and you can see that very clearly if you look at a triple point diagram. So look at that. Uh, first person to give me for extra credit the the answer to that question with the you know, to show it on a triple point diagram. How are the frequency and wavelength of light waves related? Now we're getting into review. They are inversely proportionate or indirect. This is uh, kind of talking about chapter three and four. So now we're going to start doing review problems from the book that are very important as we do chemistry. Which atom? in each pair has the larger atomic radius. So it's going to have the larger atomic radius. So it's going to have the larger principal quantum number, oxygen or sulfur. Sulfur is below oxygen, so it's going to be sulfur. Sulfur has uh, 3D, uh, 3P, uh, and oxygen is 2, 2P, so it would be sulfur would be the larger atomic radius. Excuse me. And then, um, how about potassium or bromine? Potassium or bromine? Well, potassium is 4S. What's bromine? Well, you're going to have to look that up. It's going to be potassium. What, it, what atom is, uh, is, has the large atomic radius? It's going to be potassium. Okay. Uh, I want you to look that up, too. See if that's correct. If it's not correct, first person to show me that's not correct will get extra credit. Write the complete electron configuration of each ion. Matter of fact, if there's any problems that are incorrect, first person to tell me in class and to show me why they're incorrect will get extra credit. So it's going to be calcium plus 2, so it's going to be the, the electron configuration of the closest noble gas. So it'll be argon. So it'll be 3P6, and that's right, 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6. So it's going to have the, the and now this one is going to have the, probably the same thing. It's going to be sulfur is 3P, so you're going to add 2, so it's going to be like the nearest noble gas. So it'll be the exact same thing, it'll be argon. Argon is the third one, third row. Argon is 3P. 2 is neon and 1 is helium. Okay, uh, what's next? Is there another one? Okay, lithium plus one would be helium. Uh, so it'll be 1s2. So C should be 1s2. Yeah, that's correct. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Is that it? All right, let's change maybe some of the timings of this. Uh, I had the answers there, too. It was kind of a typo, but how many unshared pairs of electrons are in each molecule? Are in each molecule. That's very interesting. 
water. There's going to be two pairs. Water's going to be two pairs. Uh, if you want to draw that out, that might be helpful. So it'll be two, two pairs. And then, then what? Which is the next molecule? Carbon monoxide. So you're going to have to draw that one out. Probably two pair. Yes, two pair makes sense. Okay. All right, now, list the intermolecular attractions between molecules in order of increasing strength. Well, I have this uh, strangely formatted, actually, uh, on the movie, iMovie. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to run the three, I'm going to run one, two, three, four, five slides very quickly because of the way I have it. You're going to have dispersion forces, dipole, dipole, you're going to have hydrogen bonding. So I'm just going to run them very quickly. So dispersion forces are going to be least than the dipole interactions and then the hydrogen bonding because it says in order of increasing. So dispersion is lowest and then hydrogen bonding is greatest. All right, write a correct formula for each compound. Uh, we're going to go through the next five slides quickly. It'll be sulfur, copper sulfide is Cu2SO3. And then nitrous acid would be HNO2, would be the answer to that, HNO2, nomenclature. And then it would be identify the binary molecular compound in each pair of substances, sodium chloride and carbon monoxide. Yeah, the first one would be carbon monoxide. Sodium chloride is ionic, it's not molecular. How about uh, phosphorus? Uh, uh, phosphorus bromide or lithium hydroxide, it would be phosphorus bromide, phosphorus tribromide, phosphorus tribromide would be the answer. That's molecular. The other one is ionic. Lithium hydroxide is ionic. And next is going to be write formulas for each. For, e for the ions, right? Formulas for these ions. So let me change the timing of this for just a bit. All right, the first one is iron 3. Well, it'll be Fe plus 3. But what I want to say to you is, I extended the slide, is that I've shortened the remaining slides to 8 seconds each. And they are review problems. So I'm going to go through them quickly. However, I did organize the answers well and that's very good however uh, I want you to be able to just look at the problem and try to do it mentally before the slide changes and look over the last bunch of slides that are review from about problem 77 ish to the end look over those problems several times make sure you can do them there's two really important elements of this lecture. One is certainly to understand chapter 13 and it will certainly help you for the test. But also for the material to come, it's also very important for you to understand all the review problems. And in order to understand the review problems, you may have to look at them several times. And we're going to do them each chapter. So by the time we've done several more chapters, the review material should be very basic to you. And if you weren't here, for part of the year and you're a new student, those problems are going to be critical for you to be able to do because the final exam is going to have a lot of that material on it. We're going to have the middle unit that I call it with nomenclature and equation writing and moles and stoichiometry so it's important to master that material well before the end of the year. Now we're going to start doing the problems and they're going to be very quick, very easy in, in terms of in being review and it's not the new material. So let's, uh, let's begin. I'll lengthen the next slide just a pinch, but then the rest of the slides are eight seconds. Okay, let's start. Okay, Fe, Fe plus three is going to be the answer to that. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to speed up the timings of these, so they're going to be going very quickly. So let's get started. 
Now, we've got about, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 problems left. So cadmium. Well, cadmium is in the same row as zinc, and they're all plus 2. That row, I know they're transition metals, but they're all plus 2, and they don't use Roman numerals with them. So CD plus 2 is going to be uh, for cadmium. Calculate the percentage by mass of the metal in each flowing compound. So it's going to be Fe2SO3. So you're going to say 56 times 2 plus 60 plus 96, sorry. And that's going to be 208. So it'll be 112 divided by 208 is going to be the uh, value of that. All right. And it's going to be 0.54 or 54%. So it's going to be 54% iron by weight. All right. Next, we have aluminum hydroxide. So it'll be 27 plus 48 plus 3, and then it'll be 27 divided by 78, which is a little bit more than a third. A third would be 33 and a third, so it's going to be 35. So the answer is 35% iron, so I'm sorry, 35% aluminum uh, is going to be the answer to that one. So you have the total mass of aluminum divided by the total mass of the molecule. Here we have total mass, the mass of one mole of sulfur dioxide, and it's going to be 888 divided by 64, and that's going to be the number of moles that you're going to get. So it's going to be 14 moles, 64 goes into 888, 14 times, so it's 14 moles, which is in 888, and now you're going to say you're going to take 2.84 times 10 to the 22nd divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and you want to know how many moles of ammonia, 2.84 times 10 to the 22nd uh, add, uh, molecules of ammonia. So it's going to be 0 0.472 times 10 to the negative 1, which is 0 0.0472 moles of aluminum. Now, so that's the answer to B. Next, 87. Hmm? Perchloric acid forms by the reaction of water and dichlorine heptaoxide. And... How many grams of dichloroheptaoxide react with excess water to form 56.2 grams of perchloric acid? So there's the stoichiometric equation. We'll put in the masses above each of the, uh, each of the uh, reactants and products as it's written. So one mole of dichloropentoxide, heptoxide is 182 grams. Two moles of perchloric acid is 200 grams. I start out with 56.2 grams of perchloric acid. How many grams of dichloroheptoxide are produced? I have my constant ratio of dichlorine heptoxide divided by 2 moles of perchloric acid. So it's 182 over 200 equals X over 56.2. Solve for X. It's going to be 51 grams. I did do the problem and it looks like about right. Just over... Uh, It'll be just, it'll be less than, it'll be between 50 and 56, 51 grams. And that's going to be the mass of dichlorine heptoxide, uh, hepta, heptoxide, okay, uh, Cl2O7. Perchloric acid forms by the equation of reaction of water and dichlorine heptoxide. We just did that, but there's going to be a part B to this. There's going to be a part B. So, the values are going to be as such. How many milliliters of water are needed to form 3.4 moles of, of, uh, of perchloric acid? Okay, so we know, that, we know that one mole of perchloric acid is 100 grams. So what is the mass of 3.4 moles of perchloric acid? It's going to be 340 grams. Okay, proportional relationship. There's the reaction. Now we've got to put the stoichiometric masses up, those masses that are written as it's written. 
18, one mole of water is 18, and two moles of perchloric acid is 200, uh, 3.4 moles is 340 grams, so do the proportional relationship with, with the constant ratio of water to perchloric acid, and that's going to be uh, 18 over 200, uh, water over two moles of perchloric acid, so it'll be 18 over 200 equals x over 340. And then you're going to solve for x using a proportional relationship, x over 340. So it'll be 18 dot times 340 divided by 200. And x is going to be equal to 30.6 grams. One milliliter equals one gram. So it'll be 30.6 30.6 milliliters, and that's going to be the answer. How many milliliters of water? So 30.6 milliliters of water is the answer in the lower left-hand corner. So it'll be 30.6 milliliters of water. Okay, next. We're almost finished. How many moles are there in each sample? 8.6 liters of carbon dioxide at STP. So 8.6 divided by 22.4 is 0.38 moles. 63.4 divided by 17 is 3.7 moles of ammonia is in 63.4 grams of ammonia. That We're doing this very quick. And then here are the problems. Let's do these one at a time. Okay, it says, why hyd when hydrogen sulfide gas is bubbled into solution of cadmium nitrate in water, the products are nitric acid and a, and a precipitate of cadmium sulfide. Write a balanced equation for the reaction. Include physical states for all reactants and products. Hydrogen sulfide gas is soluble in water. Okay, the first reaction says, it's going to say... Uh, Hydrogen sulfide uh, is going to be put into an aqueous solution, and then the cadmium nitrate is going to be plus 2 and negative 1, so that's the formula for that. It's going to produce nitric acid and cadmium sulfide. That's going to be the first reaction. Because it says, when hydrogen sulfide gas is bubbled into a solution of cadmium nitrate in water, the products are nitric acid, and a precipitate of cadmium sulfide. Okay, that's where you get the solid from on the right side of the equation. Okay, the next one is nitric acid. is going to go to N2O5 plus water. All right, and then you can put that into the equation. I kind of did that on my own there. So, and as it is balanced, you see how it's balanced? It comes out perfectly. I can literally substitute that in. Let me change the timings just for a second so I can uh, have some more time with the slide. Hold on. Okay, so I know that the nitric acid is going to break down. Even though it's a strong acid and it could stay there in some equilibrium sense, we're going to substitute in because uh, you're going to take hydro, hydrosulfuric acid or hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so it could break down into the nitric acid plus the cadmium sulfide. So now I'm going to substitute in for nitric acid N2O5 plus water, and then you're just simply going to put on that cadmium sulfide. So the final reaction is H2S plus cadmium nitrate plus dinitrogen pentoxide plus water and plus cadmium sulfide. So that's the final balanced equation for that problem. Okay, <clears throat> it says balance these equations. There's going to be two equations we have to balance. First one is vanadium 5 oxide plus hydrogen yields vanadium 3 oxide plus water. It's actually what we call a redox reaction, uh, which are normally difficult to balance, but this one's pretty easy. What do you think? Okay, so we're going to have a two in front of the hydrogen and a two in front of the water, and that will balance. Very good. The next one is going to be ammonia, uh, ammonia dichromate yields um, uh, chromate or chromium three oxide plus nitrogen plus water, 
and that's going to be a four in front of the water, and that will be balanced. <coughs> Good. Now, next problem is going to be uh, 91. List the metal that ranks higher in the activity series of metals. That's what you need. You need to, you know, put this on pause. You need the activity series of metals from the text, and you can do that. So, magnesium and mercury, that's kind of an easy one. Magnesium is very active. Anything in the first two columns is going to be pretty active. So that's going to trump anything in the transition metals. Uh, so it'll be magnesium will be there. That's an easy one. You don't have to really look that one up. Uh, the next one may be a little bit more difficult. But <clears throat> the alkali metals and the alkali earth metals are usually much more reactive than anything in the transition metal peer, anything in the transition metals. Now the next one is potassium and lithium. That's an interesting one. What, how does the activity go? as you go down the alkali metals and why the activity does that. Uh, so what do you think? Is it going to be potassium or lithium? Yeah, it's lithium. It's lithium. You would think maybe potassium because the electron might be more weakly held than the lithium. But the helium uh, atom that it would become when it gives up that electron is extremely stable. Classify each reaction as a combination, decomposition, single replacement, double displacement, or combustion reaction. <clears throat> so in this one, I'm going to give you a reaction like this, and you're going to have to say what it is. Well, this one's pretty obvious, don't you think? This one is going to be a synthesis uh, reaction, or otherwise known as a combination reaction. A combination reaction or a synthesis reaction is really the same thing. There's really very little difference in the two. The next one is going to be, wait for it. I have these on a little bit. I have these on 15 seconds because I uh, want to be able to talk about various things about it. Okay, the next one is a little weird. A little weird. But you see that it's going to be a hydrogen car, hydrocarbon plus oxygen. You don't have to look any further. It's a combustion. A, hydrogen, a hydrocarbon plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. That is a combustion reaction. Very simple stuff. Looks weird when you first see it. You're like thinking single displacement, double displacement, etc. Et uh, the complete decomposition of sucrose, table sugar, caused by strong heating may be represented by that equation. And uh, for the decomposition of one mole of sucrose, how many grams of water are produced? All right, so this is the first problem. How many grams of water are produced? Uh, let me extend the other slide. I want to talk about that for a minute before we get to this slide. Hold on. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me finish talking about this problem a little bit. It says, for the decomposition of one mole, <clears throat> that's important, one mole of sucrose, how many grams of hydrogen of um, water are produced? I was going to say hydrogen oxide. How many grams of water are produced? What is the total number of moles of product produced? How many grams of carbon are produced with one mole of sucrose? Well, the number of moles of product, that's an easy one, but we'll get to that. We'll take A first. So what I did was I, I stopped the tape and I reset the timings. Uh, this is written conveniently as one mole of sucrose yields 11 moles of water plus 12 moles of carbon and it says how many grams of water are produced what is the total number of moles of product produced how many grams of carbon are produced now it's <clears throat> for the decomposition of one mole of sucrose so if I figure out the stoichiometric masses the stoichiometric mass for one mole of sucrose, 11 moles of water, and 12 moles of carbon, I can just essentially read the answers off the equation. And the stoichiometric masses will be the answer to it. So <clears throat> right now we could say B would be what is the total number of moles of product produced? And it's going to be obvious. It's going to be 23 moles, 11 moles of water, and 12 moles of carbon. Now, what I'll do is, on the next slide, 
I will show you how very basic, very basic this really is. Remember, it's on one mole of sucrose. And it says how many grams of water are produced? Well, it's 198. And because I'm not making a big deal out of this. I'm not doing a calculation like I normally do because it's based on the stoichiometric masses. So it says in the comp uh, decomposition of sucrose below, the equation shows one mole of sucrose breaks down to 11 moles of water plus 12 moles of carbon. The stoichiometric masses are above the equation. So it's a very basic problem. And let's go on to, let's go on to B. I'm going to change the timings again. So what is the total number of moles of product produced? 23. We already went over that. Uh, the next one is going to be probably uh, what mass of carbon will be produced? Well, it's going to be 144. How many grams of carbon are produced? Yeah, it's 144. So that was a pretty straightforward problem. Uh, and it shows you simply that the stoichiometric masses, when you write them in, are very useful, either doing a proportional relationship or just reading them off. Next question is hydrogen reacts with ethene at C2H4 to form ethane C2H6. There's the reaction. What is the limiting reagent when 40 grams of ethene react with 3 grams of hydrogen? There's the reaction. I'm going to test this. Remember the test. Ch choose one, and if you don't have enough of the other one, that's the limiting reagent. Or if you have too much of the other one, then the one you're testing is the limiting reagent. So I'm going to test 3 grams of hydrogen, and I'm going to find that I, have, I would need... 42 grams of ethene, so I don't have enough there, so that's going to be the limiting reagent, and that's the test, and that's the answer to that question. So it's an easy test, it's a very, very easy way of checking limiting reagent. Iron 2 sulfide is produced when iron is heated with sulfur. What is the theoretical yield of iron sulfide if 25 grams of iron react with 32 grams of sulfur? So that's the reaction that occurs, and you can see that it's going to be FeS because that's going to be um, <clears throat> it's going to be iron two, so it's going to be FeS three because that's what it says in the problem. All right, let's finish this up uh, quickly. I even have the answer for ninety five above. It's thirty nine point four grams of iron sulfide and 0.448 moles. Those are the stoichiometric masses. I hope it's obvious that the iron is limiting reagent in the above reaction because I can't use 32 grams of sulfur. If I did, I would need 56 grams of iron. So I'm going to use iron to determine the uh, product X. So it's going to be 56 over 88 equals 25 over X, and then solve for X, and it will be 88 times 25 divided by 56. Please make sure you can do this problem, and then it's going to be 39.3 grams, or 0.448 moles. And then it's going to be 39.3 grams divided by 88 is 0.45 moles which is what they give as the answer, but with three simian figures. Again, two simian figures is fine. What is the percent yield in 95 if only 16.5 grams of iron 2 sulfide is produced? So it's going to be the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. In other words, what you got divided by what you were supposed to get times 100, 16.5 divided by 39.3 times 100 is going to equal, looks like about a third-ish. Not quite that, might not be, be more than that. 42, 42%. So that's going, that's your, uh, that's your yield, percent yield for your experiment. You got 42%. And that ends the lecture. Uh, please make sure that you do the problems thoroughly. 
that you just don't put the answer. I want to see that you can work them out and have a good day and goodbye.